there are all kinds of toys up here. I didn't realize that. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us here at the Heritage Foundation. I'm John Hilbolt, Director of Lectures and Seminars, and it's my privilege to welcome you to our Douglas and Sarah Allison Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who are joining us on the Heritage.org website, and we remind our Internet viewers that questions or comments can be addressed to us at any time, simply emailing us at speaker at heritage.org. And for those in-house, we do ask that courtesy check that cell phones and other electronic devices have been turned off as a courtesy to our speaker and for recording purposes. Uh, we will post the program within 24 hours on our Heritage website, also for your future reference. Hosting our discussion this afternoon is Becky Norton Dunlop. Mrs. Dunlop is Vice President for External Relations here at the Heritage Foundation. She oversees Heritage's strategic and communication outreach both nationally and internationally to conservative public policy institutions, other leadership organizations, and policy activists. Uh, prior to joining Heritage, Mrs. Dunlop served as Secretary of Natural Resources for the Commonwealth of Virginia in the cabinet of Governor George Allen. As a senior administration official in the Reagan administration, she served as White House Deputy Assistant to the President for Presidential Personnel and also as Special Assistant to the President and Director of his Cabinet Office. She then became a Special Assistant to Attorney General Ed Meese and after that went to the Department of Interior where she was a Deputy Undersecretary and later Assistant Secretary for Fish, Wildlife and Parks. She currently serves as a board member of numerous public policy organizations and associations here in this area and across the United States. Uh, please join me in welcoming my colleague, Becky Norton Dunlop. Becky. Thank you, John, and it really is a privilege for me to welcome our guest today and to welcome all of you uh, to the Heritage Foundation. Uh, we have hosted Dr. Stephen Meyer here at Heritage before and uh, he is a formidable speaker and presenter and um, arouses a lot of emotions both here and in people who will be watching this over the internet and later. Uh, we're privileged to have him uh, for no a number of reasons. One, because he comes from the Discovery Institute, an institute based in Seattle, Washington. There you go, you can clap for Discovery. Uh, we have many good friends there and consider them a close partner and ally. Dr. Meyer earned his PhD in the history and philosophy of science from Cambridge University and uh, his dissertation was on the history of origin of life biology and the methodology of the historical sciences. This is not something that we work on at the Heritage Foundation. <laughs> so it's always a privilege to have someone bring a new topic uh, to us. He also has worked as a geophysicist with the Atlantic Richfield Company after earning his undergraduate degrees in physics and geology. In 2004, Dr. Meyer ignited a firestorm of media and scientific controversy when a biology journal at the Smithsonian Institute, probably mistakenly, but happily so, published his peer-reviewed scientific article, Advancing Intelligent Design. He's been, of course, on many national television and radio programs. Uh, he has been on the front page of a number of newspapers uh, to the delight of his uh, children. And um, he has previously co-written or edited two books, uh, Darwinism, Design, and Public Education with Michigan State University Press and Science and Evidence of Design in the Universe by Ignatius 2000. He's the author of a number of articles, and uh, he has written a fine new book here, Signature in the Cell, DNA and the Evidence for Intelligent Design. Now, I thought it would be important for me to just uh, read to you a couple of the blurbs here in the book, uh, because they're not ones you will read unless you are privileged to own the book and actually begin reading it. But I thought that they were very good, and I think it's good to have these on the public record. The first one, <clears throat> quote, Meyer demolishes the materialistic superstition at the core of evolutionary biology by exposing its Achilles heel, its utter blindness to the origins of information. With the recognition that cells function as fast as supercomputers and as fruitfully as so many factories, 
the case for a mindless cosmos collapses. His refutation of Richard Dawkins will have all the dogs barking and the angels singing. End quote. And that is a quote of George Gilder, author of Wealth and Poverty and Telecosm. Another one, uh, quote, a, a must read for all serious students of the origin of life debate. Not only is it a comprehensive defense of the theory of intelligent design, it is a lucid and rigorous exposition of the various dimensions of the scientific method. Students of chemistry and biology at all levels, high school, undergraduate, or postgraduate, will find much to challenge their thinking in this book. That is a quote of Alistair Noble, a PhD in chemistry and the former BBC education officer and Her Majesty's Inspector of Schools for Science in Scotland. I think that that is a very, those are two just excellent endorsements, uh, Steve. And then let me just note the last one that I'll just mention to you. A quote, in this engaging narrative, Meyer demonstrates what I, as a chemist, have long, long suspected. Undirected chemical processes cannot produce the exquisite complexity of the living cell. Meyer also shows compelling positive evidence for intelligent design in the digital code stored in the cell's DNA, a decisive case based upon breathtaking and cutting-edge science." End quote. And that is Dr. Philip S. Skell, National Academy of Sciences and Evan Pugh Professor Emeritus at Pennsylvania State University. So already, Dr. Meyer's book uh, has been endorsed by a number of highly qualified and very well accepted in the uh, academy uh, people of note. And with that, let me welcome Dr. Steve Meyer to our podium for a presentation on Signature in the Cell. Thank you. Becky forgot to mention the one that said creationist in a cheap tuxedo, but uh, we'll, we'll uh, overlook that part. Well, that's a terrific uh, setup. Um, uh, good afternoon, and thanks, uh, everyone, for coming. I'm just going to get the PowerPoint up and running here. As you may know, this year is an auspicious uh, year in the history of science. It's the 200th anniversary of the birth of Charles Darwin and the 150th uh, anniversary coming up later in November of the publication of The Origin of Species. And there are events planned in universities and colleges all around the country. There's a great discussion that's uh, uh, emerged about the legacy of Darwin. And I had the opportunity in February to actually speak in uh, what I thought from the map was Shrewsbury, his uh, birthplace, but I learned when I was there it's pronounced Shrewsbury. Okay, it's a British thing. Anyway, when I was in Britain and uh, speaking uh, about the, the legacy of Darwin, I also learned that uh, his legacy is being commemorated this year in the United Kingdom. We have the Queen on one side of the 10-pound note and Charles Darwin on the other. Uh, and uh, so there's quite a lot of worldwide interest in just this question, what is Charles Darwin's legacy? What, his, what has he left us? What has he taught us? And uh, there are many things that have come into Western science because of Darwin. One is uh, something that I appreciate very much, which is a very rigorous method of studying the remote past. He actually pioneered a method of historical scientific investigation. He also gave us the idea of, uh, of uh, natural selection. He had a theory about the history of life. But in most intellectual histories of Darwin, it's generally agreed that the primary thing he established or the primary thing he showed was that there is no evidence of design in biology. That his primary legacy is that he refuted the design argument. And I have a, 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 a brief quotation here that uh, conveys this from Francisco Ayala, who is the past president of the, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And Ayala says this, he says, the functional design of organisms and their features would seem to argue for the existence of a designer. But it was Darwin's greatest accomplishment to show that the directive organization of living things could be explained as the result of a purely natural process, natural selection, without, without any need to resort to a creator or any other external agent. 
So uh, Darwin shows that, as Ayal has put it more recently, you have design without a designer. You have the appearance of design without real design. Now this is the classical and still current Darwinian perspective. And as a result of this, the, the consensus around this among many in evolutionary biologists, there have been other ideas advanced, extensions of this idea. Um, one biologist says that this denial of design is the foundation of the worldview in the West of, of scientific materialism. That's Douglas Fatuma, uh, who's written a prominent evolutionary uh, biology textbook. Um, and th this idea of materialism, or the uh, that it goes closely with the ideal of, uh, idea of the denial of design, has uh, emboldened a group of scientists who now have the title the New Atheists. And they made quite a splash in the media in 2006, 2007, because of the, their, their unparalleled success in publishing a number of books, one by Richard Dawkins called The God Delusion, another by, Richard, uh, by uh, Daniel Dennett called Breaking the Spell, the Spell Being Religion. And the argument in these books was, was basically that science has disproven the existence of God, or at least rendered belief in God incredible. And the argument would run something like this. The design argument has always been the most compelling reason to believe in God. After Darwin, we know there is no evidence of design. Therefore, belief in God is tantamount to a delusion. We may not be able to disprove it with absolute certainty, but as Dawkins says, belief in God is very, very, very improbable. Okay? Now, the premise in this argument is that there is no evidence of design. And while the new atheists take that in a, in a kind of uh, in-your-face, overt, radical direction, that premise is shared uh, by a lot of scientists still today, although, uh, as I'm going to show, there's reasons to doubt it. Um, now, why is that conviction that there is no evidence of design in biology so widespread, or why has it been so widespread, such that people uh, 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 credit Darwin, this, this as being Darwin's central legacy? Well, here's the Darwinian pr perspective in a nutshell. It comes from Richard Dawkins. He says that biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. Uh, we have some student-looking people here today, so I'll give a quiz. Uh, what's the key, the key word in this quotation from a, a, the Darwinian point of view? Appearance. Okay, it's appearance. Exactly right. Um, the, it's, all biologists agree that living things have complicated organization. Many think that organization looks as though it were designed. And here Dawkins affirms the same thing. But he's saying that appearance is illusory. It's not real. It's, and w now why does he say that? He says that because from the Darwinian point of view, the appearance of design in living organisms has resulted from an undirected process, natural selection acting on random variations, with the emphasis on natural and random purely undirected process that can mimic the powers of a designing intelligence without itself being designed or guided in any way. That's classical Darwinian thought. It's reaffirmed by the modern neo-Darwinists. Richard Dawkins is perhaps its primary spokesman for this point of view, but it's uh, a very common point of view. Now, the question I want to ask today is whether or not this is actually correct. Is every appearance of design in biology the result of a purely undirected process, su such that we can safely say that the appearance of design is illusory. Um, let's put that question in some, in some perspective. This is Darwin's famous tree of life. It's his representation of the history of life. It's his, uh, it captures his idea that, that all the living forms today, which are represented by the branches at the top of the tree, ultimately descended by a slow, gradual, undirected process from earlier, simpler forms of life going all the way back to the first primordial organism. So you could think of that first organism changing a little tiny bit and gradually morphing into new forms over, over millions and millions and indeed billions of years. Um, now, according to Darwin, um, well, Darwin's theory explains, uh, he asserts, every appearance of design that arises after the origin of life itself to the present time. So you could think of the coiled nautilus, you could think of the eye of the, uh, in a mammalian species, you could think of uh, the, uh, the pressure sensors in a giraffe's neck, all these extraordinary features of living systems that have arisen since the origin of life have arisen as the result of natural selection acting on random mutations of various kinds producing these appearances of design, but again that's a, an illusion because we have this 
unguided process guiding, uh, not guiding, <laughs> but uh, producing the whole, the whole um, uh, panoply of living organisms. Now, there's debate within biological circles, perhaps a suppressed debate, a submerged debate, but there is debate about whether or not this, this assertion is correct. There are scientists now who question whether Darwin's theory can produce all the complex forms that we see in the history of life, and in particular, whether Darwin's theory can produce the, the nanotechnology, the complexity that we see at the cellular level, and the, the intricate body plans that arise in events like the Cambrian explosion the, or the mammalian radiation. Uh, but that's not the debate I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to do, as, uh, as lawyers say, um, uh, argue, uh, or concede for the sake of argument, do the ad arguendo move. And I'm going to say, let's, let's set that debate about the sufficiency of Darwin's theory aside. And let's look at another more fundamental question. Um, we're going to look at the question of the origin of life, another potential loci or occasion where design might have played a role in the history of life. And we're going to ask whether or not there's any evidence of design there, or whether we, again, have merely the appearance of design or maybe no appearance of design whatsoever. And I'm, I'm going to be talking about what's at the very base of the tree, what's represented by the base of the tree in the Darwinian picture of the history of life, and that is the origin of the very first life itself. That's a question that Darwin never addressed. And oddly, in 150 years, though people have tried, it's generally conceded that no one has succeeded in providing an undirected evolutionary explanation for how that life began. So do we have perhaps evidence of design at, at that point in the history of life? Well, in the 19th century, people didn't worry too much about that question. They didn't have an answer for it. They had no explanation for the origin of the first life. Darwin himself was quite explicit about that, that he didn't propose one in the origin of species, nor was he capable of providing one, though he did offer a few uh, admitted speculations about the topic. But people in the 19th century, scientists in the 19th century, were not very worried about the absence of such an evolutionary explanation because they assumed that the cell was exceedingly simple. Uh, I love this quotation because it makes me feel so smart. It's uh, from Thomas Henry Huxley, 1869. He's Darwin's famous bulldog, uh, one of the leading evolutionary biologists of the 19th century. And he, he captured the view of life at its most fundamental level in 1869. He said, the cell is a simple homogeneous globule of plasm, OK? Uh, translated jello or goo, those are the non-scientific terms that capture the idea. Uh, the idea there is you've got a, uh, the cell is made of a few simple chemicals, and because of that, you could readily imagine a, f a very few simple chemical reactions from simple compounds combining and recombining and producing this protoplasmic, protoplasmic substance that was assumed to be the essence of life in the 1860s and 1870s. Now, that view gradually began to change, but it changed dramatically beginning in the 1950s. And uh, beginning with what uh, is now called the molecular biological revolution, there was a dramatic uh, change in our understanding of how complex life is at this f most fundamental and allegedly simple level. Um, the, uh, the, perhaps the, the key discovery in this period of time was, of course, Watson and Crick's discovery of the structure of the DNA molecule. They elucidated the double helix structure of DNA, and they cracked along standing mystery, the mystery of the origin, uh, or rather the mystery of where biological information resides. Where is the information that is responsible for hereditary traits uh, in the cell? Where does it reside? Where does it, is it stored? Um, the, the helix was a, a very exciting discovery, the structure, but what was even more exciting, and was, it was, Watson and Crick intimated this in 1953 in their first paper, was that the helix had a structure that lent itself to the storage of information. Now, um, Crick picked up on that idea in 1957 with something called the sequence hypothesis. And I actually think this is perhaps the most uh, bold conjecture in the history of biology. It's certainly one of the most significant discoveries. Its confirmation led to this molecular biological revolution I was talking about. And the sequence hypothesis was simply the idea that along the spine of the DNA molecule, uh, running on the, uh, the interior of the molecule and the uh, longitudinal axis there, where you see the A's, C's, G's, and T's depicted. Uh, Crick 
uh, suggested that those chemicals, those A's, C's, T's, and G's called bases, function just like alphabetic characters in a written language or digital characters in a section of software. And um, at the time, he speculated that the instructions stored by those, those characters, those chemical characters, had something to do with the construction of proteins, which were at, the same, in, at nearly the same time also being uh, elucidated and, and, and studied carefully. In uh, 1958, a man named John Kendrew first discovered that the protein myoglobin had an extraordinary three-dimensional structure. And here I have a little visual aid that will uh, assist our scientific discussion. These are snap lock blocks. It says on the box from which I stole them that they are for students ages two to four. Um, in any case, they'll assist, assist nicely here. Um, the, uh, we now know today that proteins are made of long chains of smaller molecules called amino acids, and I'm representing them with these colorful beads. If, uh, uh, when, when amino acids are linked together, they exert forces on one another and cause intricate three-dimensional structures to arise. In 1958, when Kendrew elucidated the structure of uh, myoglobin, whale myoglobin, he made an extraordinary discovery, which was that proteins, which were long thought to be simple, repetitive structures, actually had very intricate, complex three-dimensional shapes. And it was determined that these three-dimensional shapes, in turn, result from the very specific arrangements of amino acids. You get the amino acids are linked up in the right way. They exert forces on each other that create three-dimensional shapes. Now, the more, even more interesting discovery about proteins is that these three-dimensional shapes are absolutely essential for the jobs that proteins perform. You could kind of think of it as like the toolbox out in your garage. You have a saw, a hammer, a wrench, uh, pliers. Each one of those tools performs a, f a function, and the function it performs is closely related to the shape and, uh, of, the, of the tool itself. Um, you, you can't pound very well with, with a saw. Uh, you can't cut very well with a hammer. The, the shape of, the, of the, uh, the tool is important for its job. Well, it's the same thing is true with proteins. These intricate three-dimensional shapes uh, actually are, are crucial to the, pro the, 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 the functions they perform because they, get, they, they, will, they will fit hand and glove like with other molecules to, to uh, catalyze reactions, to form structural parts of larger machines, uh, to uh, be parts of the machines that process information. So the, the, this three-dimensional structure is critical. What Crick anticipated was that the instructions on the DNA molecule had something to do with the construction of those proteins. And he, it, it turns out that he was right. And in fact, we have a little animation that shows exactly what um, was discovered in the period called the molecular biological revolution. Um, many scientific hypotheses are confirmed with a single experiment. Crick's took many years to establish, uh, to establish that he was correct. Now, this is the DNA molecule. You see the tightly wound strands with the ACs, Gs, and Ts represented in the middle. This is uh, a, a little animation showing the molecule being unwound, separated, so that it can be copied by this large molecular machine called a polymerase. Now, this is a view of the inside of the polymerase as the process of, D, of gene, what's called gene expression uh, proceeds. This is a copy of the, the DNA message being made at the polymerase. There it's coming off very fast on the right, and now that's going to move towards the outer part of the cell, going through a little gated porthole called the nuclear pore complex. In Washington, we learn, or in civics class, you learn how a bill becomes a law. This is how a gene becomes a protein, how, a gene become, uh, how the DNA information directs protein synthesis. So here's the, the information passing through this gated porthole out of the nucleus. It's going to go to a, uh, essentially a molecular factory called a ribosome. It's a two-part factory that collapses on top of this transcript. And now that's, the transcript of information is going to be threaded through, and an assembly line then ensues where the DNA or the copy of the DNA called messenger RNA and on the top is going to, to direct the construction of a growing chain of amino acids. And it, depending on the arrangement of those amino acids, you'll get uh, one protein or another. And you can see it actually takes place very rapidly. Here's the ribosome from another view. 
uh, the, the, the spent transcript is coming off the top, and the protein the, is there at the bottom, and it begins its process of folding. The folding process is even more intricate. It often goes off to a, another barrel-shaped machine uh, called a chaperone, where it nestles into precise grooves. Again, great specificity of fit, and, uh, and then is folded properly at the chaperone. Uh, I think the animator will have it light up when it gets in the right configuration. There we go. Boom, we've got a protein now, and then off it goes out into the, the, uh, the cytoplasm, the outer, working, the outer part of the cell, to do its job. And uh, an intricate, intricate process. And this is what was elucidated by Watson and Crick, or uh, not by Watson and Crick, in the wake of Watson and Crick's discovery by uh, other, the community of molecular biologists in the 1950s and 60s. And we're learning more about it all the time. Even though this looks complex in the animation, in many ways this is just a cartoon version of the complexity of this intricate information processing system. And one of, the, one of the really extraordinary things about this is that not only is there information on DNA, but the information on DNA is used to build the proteins, which in turn are involved in the processing of that information on the DNA. So you have a classic engineering closed loop. It's an extraordinary system. So uh, I said at the beginning, or just a minute ago, that Watson and Crick cracked a mystery. They cracked the mystery of the structure of the DNA molecule. But that's not the mystery I want to talk about today. The mystery I want to talk about today I call the DNA enigma. It's not the structure of the DNA molecule. Watson and Crick did a great job of, of, uh, of solving that mystery. It's not even the question of where biological information resides. Uh, we now have a good idea of that as well. Um, there's digital code stored along the spine of the DNA molecule. It's not even what the information in DNA does. We just saw an animation that illustrates roughly what that information does do. The, the mystery that I call the DNA enigma, the deeper mystery, is the mystery of where that information came from. It's the question of the origin of the information in DNA. And that is closely linked to another long-standing mystery in biology, and that's the mystery we mentioned at the, at the beginning of the lecture, the mystery of the origin of life. One origin of life biologist puts it this way. He says, the problem of the origin of life is basically equivalent to the problem of the origin of biological information. Now, if we think about that for a minute, it, make, it makes good sense. I used to ask my students, if you want to give your computer a new function, what do you have to give it? Software, code. It's, it's, in our information age, this is an, this is an obvious answer. Um, the same thing is true in biology. If you want to build a new structure from a pre-existing structure, you want to build a new organism from a pre-existing organism, you need new proteins. Therefore, you need new lines of digital code on the DNA. But at an even more primary level, if you want to get life going in the first place, if you want to build the first cell, you have to give an account of where the information came from that runs the show in biology. DNA and, and we now know other forms of information are absolutely central to the function of living organisms. So where does that information come from? If you want to explain the origin of life, you've got to explain what life is, how it works, what we know about it. And what we know is that, is, is that information does run the show in biology. And so that's the, the central question. Now, um, this question is, uh, I, this, this question I call the, the DNA enigma. In the first line of my book, I, I start by saying, Watson and Crick, when Watson and Crick elucidated the structure of DNA, they solved one mystery, but they created another. And the mystery they created I call this DNA enigma. I first encountered this mystery in 1985. I was a young scientist at the time working in the field of digital signal processing in the oil industry. I was a geophysicist looking for all out in the guff as the Texans, uh, my, my Texan bosses said. And uh, the, a conference came to, to Dallas, where I was working. And it was a, really a world-class conference on, t on the big questions in science, the origin of the universe, the origin of life, the nature of human consciousness. And the, the conference featured scientists who were from a materialistic philosophical perspective and those of a uh, non-materialistic or perhaps theistic perspective squaring off, giving different interpretations of the scientific data on these key questions. And I became fascinated with the panel on the origin of life. I knew really very little about the topic at the time. I assumed that uh, evolutionary theory had the, the, uh, th this, this issue pretty well sewn up, that everything had been explained. But there was a scientist on the panel who shocked everyone by announcing that his own, uh, at that time, 
uh, leading theory of how life had first emerged from the primordial ooze, the molecules to first cell idea, was incorrect. His name was Dean Kenyon. He had written a book called Biochemical Predestination, which was, uh, at the time, the leading college-level textbook, advanced-level book on this, on this subject. And he announced that his, his idea, he no he, that he no longer believed his idea and that he repudiated it there. Uh, another scientist then spoke who had just written a book called The Mystery of Life's Origin. His name was Charles Thaxton. You see his picture on the screen. And he gave a point-by-point -point critique of the different theories of the origin of life that were then in currency and showed that they had multiple problems. And in particular, they could not solve the problem of the origin of biological information. Now, what surprised me was that many of the scientists on the panel, in fact, almost all, agreed with many of the points of his critique. And there was really no dispute about whether or not the field of what I learned to call origin of life biology or chemical evolutionary theory was in a state of impasse. Um, and one of the reasons for that was something that Thaxton clarified at the time, and that has to do with the nature of the information in DNA or the nature. Some people talk about the ordering of those bases, those A's, C's, G's, and T's. And what Thaxton pointed out was that the ordering of those bases uh, is, is not just any old kind of order. The bases are arranged, would be a better way to put it, but they're not in a simple order like ABC, ABC, or the kind of order you find in a crystal with NaCl, the two chemical elements uh, repeating in a, in a, in a perfect, uh, perfectly uh, redundant way. Instead, what you have inside the cell is a non-repeating order, not like the sequence on top, which you might call random or something that is merely complex, but rather like the sequence on the bottom where the arrangement is critical to the function of the sequence. We, uh, the term that was used at the conference and has been used since is the idea of specified complexity. The arrangement is not just complex, it's complex and specified so that it performs a function. And this, Thaxton uh, argued, was the kind of arrangement of characters or the kind of information that you have in DNA. And that was the critical thing that had to be explained. That was an, a central part of the DNA enigma. Now, why is that so mysterious? Well, in part, because that's exactly the kind of string of characters that we have in a written language or in a computer code. And Richard Dawkins himself has acknowledged this by noting that the genes, the DNA, the information in DNA, is like a machine code. He said the machine code of the genes is uncannily computer-like. Uh, Bill Gates, our local hero out in uh, Seattle in Redmond, Washington, says that DNA is like a computer program, but far more advanced than any we've ever created. So we have clearly a striking appearance of design. When we're talking about information that is functionally specified in this way, we're talking about something which in our experience is almost, well, is entirely uh, the result of, always the result of an intelligent agency. So we have an appearance of design, and yet at this point at least, or at that point at the conference when I was first learning about it, no uh, unguided processes that can explain that appearance. And that really set me on uh, something of, of an intellectual adventure, because I wanted to know if there was, um, there were in fact solutions to this mystery. C could this be explained from within the standard evolutionary framework? A year later, I found myself in graduate school at Cambridge University in the philosophy of science, and I began to work on this question of the origin of life. And I found that the mystery was indeed very profound, and in fact, I, what, I, what I found was that every attempt to solve the mystery of the origin of the information that you need to build life just had the effect of deepening the mystery. And there was a, f a famous book written by a colleague of, uh, of Francis Crick called Chance and Necessity, written by Jacques Minot, famous French mo molecular biologist. And he said just uh, something that's fairly non-controversial for many scientists, which is that if you're going to be a scientist, you want to explain something, you have a, a few basic tools. You can try to explain things by reference to to random or chance processes, you can in, or you can invoke natural laws or forces of necessity. If we drop something and it falls to the ground, physicists would describe that motion with the law of gravity. Minot would say that that object has fallen by necessity in a law-like way. So that's his idea. Use chance, use laws, or the combination of the two. And so most of the attempts to explain the origin of information have uh, fallen along those lines. And as I begin to examine the different categories, the different attempts, the different uh, approaches to explaining the origin of information, 
what I found was that the mystery was a very profound one indeed, and that every attempt to solve it actually deepened it. And let, so let me just sketch some of the, in a, in a kind of rough and ready way, some of the problems that scientists have encountered as, they, as they've attempted to explain the origin of biological information in, in, in different ways. Uh, the first is, the, the first approach is what's called chance. Um, and uh, lot, lots of folks, uh, lots of scientists, especially early on in the 1950s, 1960s, thought that this could solve the problem of the origin of information. Because if you think of a specified sequence, uh, maybe uh, some Scrabble letters arranged to, to spell something, you could imagine that uh, if you had enough time in trials and you, know, you were shaking the bag around long enough, that randomly they, they might fall into place. And that was kind of the idea. But the problem with that um, became very clear, and it became clear in the 60s as scientists began to realize just how enormously complex the DNA molecule was and the protein molecules that are produced by the DNA, just how complex both of those big macromolecules are. And, and the problem that they identified uh, has acquired a name. It's called the problem of combinatorials. Let, to illustrate, let's, let's say we're going to try to create a little dinosaur here. I've got a, a puzzle. I don't know if you can see this. It's got six, uh, uh, four different dials, six uh, possibilities on each dial. There's a stegosaurus, and the stegosaurus uh, is labeled on one of the dials. It's, there's a tail, a body, and a head. And the idea is you're supposed to turn the puzzle to get all the parts to line up, so you get the stegosaurus parts lined up, the T-Rex parts lined up, and you know, you get the idea. So the question is, what is the probability of getting the puzzle to, of, of cracking the puzzle, of, of, of getting it right, if I were to just turn this at random. Well, I've got six dials, or four dials, six sites. So we've got six possibilities on this dial, um, and then I've got six on this. So just to get the head and torso correct, how many, how many possibilities do we have? 36. 36, very good. We're tempted, aren't we, to say six plus six possibilities, but it's actually six times six, right? Um, because every, every possibility on this dial has six combinations that could go with it. So we've got six times six total possible combinations. If we go to three dials, how many possibilities? Testing your math here. Two, oh man, we've got, we got some wizards in the audience. Okay, 216. All right, so 216 possibilities. One more dial, and we're up to, I did this beforehand, 1,296 possibilities. Now, you, you can see what's happening to the number of possibilities. They're not growing in an additive way, are they? They're growing exponentially. Okay, it's actually six to the fourth power by the time we get out. Now, this is essentially, so you get very big numbers very quickly if you've got a combinatorial system. And this is what you have with both DNA and proteins. Let me illustrate the case with proteins. If you've got 10 sites uh, where the amino acids are, are linked together, you, that represents a huge number of corresponding possible arrangements, all right? You've got at each site along the growing chain, 20 possible protein-forming amino acids that could figure in. There's actually about 250 amino acids total, but we're just going to set aside the non-protein-forming ones for sake of argument. If we just consider the protein-forming amino acids that are possible, you've got 20 times 20 times 20 times 20 possibilities out 10 places, which is 20 to the 10th power, or 10 trillion possible combinations. Okay, do you see? This is the problem of combinatorials. Now, uh, proteins are typically about 300 amino acids. That's an average length. A short, there are shorter proteins, but if we look at one of about half of that, just a very modest length protein of 150 amino acids, you see that the, the number of possible combinations of amino acids just becomes enormous very quickly. It would be 20 to the 150th power, or 1 in 10 to the 195th. Okay, very, very big numbers. Now, if we go back to my little illustration Where'd my dino thing go? There, here we go. Okay, let me just r run a thought experiment by you. If, uh, if, I, if I ask you what are the odds of, of cracking the puzzle, you could say, well, the odds are one chance in 1296, we said. But we also have to take into account how many different trials you might have. And so let's say I'm gonna give you four, four tries. Is it more likely or less likely than not that you would crack the puzzle if I only give you four trials and you've got 1296 possibilities to search. It's going to be less, right? Less, it's less likely than not that you'll, you'll crack it, okay? In other words, to make a judgment about whether or not chance 
is a plausible explanation, you have to know something about what my colleague Bill Dembski calls the probabilistic resources, the number of tries you're going to get to crack the puzzle. Well, the problem in the case of proteins is that the combinatorial complexity of even a single short protein vastly exceeds the number of events that have taken place since the Big Bang, such that you, it's much like only being given two or three tries to crack the dinosaur puzzle. It's always going to be much more likely than not that an undirected search would stumble on one of the few functional sequences among the vast combination of all the possibilities. Now, the number, I haven't put the exact numbers here. I made a much more precise calculation in the book, but I want to just illustrate this conceptually. There's a different set of numbers in the book. There's a, there's a number of factors that you have to analyze to get a, a precise estimate of the probability of, of finding one protein by chance. And I take all those factors into account. But essentially, the problem is the same problem as trying to crack this puzzle with only a few tries at your disposal. All the events since the Big Bang represent a, a very minuscule fraction uh, in relation to the number of combinations that have to be searched. And that's the problem of chance. And so as a result of that, most scientists, uh, in fact, I don't know of any scientist today who's working seriously on the origin of life who thinks that chance has, it represents a, a, a credible, a reasonable explanation for the origin of biological information. Here's one who says that blind chance is very limited. It can produce low levels of cooperation exceedingly easily, the equivalent of small words or letters. But chance becomes very quickly incompetent as the amount of organization or information is, uh, is required. I, I used to do an illustration when I was in teaching college where I'd pass around a bag of Scrabble letters and have students pick letters out at random and then go put them on the chalkboard to see how much specified, functionally specified information they could produce by chance alone. Always you'd get gibberish on the board very quickly. Okay? And that's what this scientist is saying. So chance is not the way to go. Um, but many scientists have taken a more a classically Darwinian approach and try to explain the origin of information. They, they realize in Darwin's view, you, his mechanism involved both chance and natural selection working in tandem. And so some scientists have said, well, maybe we should invoke natural selection acting at the prebiotic level before we have life to explain the origin of the information that you need to get life. But there's a, there's a problem with this. And the problem has to do with what you need to get natural selection going. Um, natural selection requires, uh, and if you think about it in the Darwinian sense, it's the idea of uh, 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 differential survival and competition among organisms in the next generation. Uh, if you've got a new trait that arises, it's passed on uh, to the next generation uh, if it confers a survival advantage. But all that presupposes you have living organisms that can reproduce themselves, create offspring which can compete with each other, and, and then decide, in, in essence, through that process, which, which traits will get passed on. So natural selection presupposes the existence of self-replicating organisms. But self-replication in organisms is, is uh, conducted, is transacted, as the result of the existence of DNA and proteins. DNA replication is part of the process of cell division and so forth. And so if you're going to have natural selection, you've got to have self-replicating organisms, which in turn presupposes the existence of information-rich DNA and proteins. What were we trying to explain the origin of? The origin of DNA and proteins, in particular, the information in them. So this is what in logic is known as a question-begging explanation. Okay? It presupposes the very thing that we're trying to explain in the first place. I have an illustration of the problem that I've shared with students. Uh, you've got a guy who's walking home from work. He, uh, he's not paying attention to where he's going. He must be a philosopher of science. And uh, he falls in a big pit. He gets in the pit and he realizes you know, you've, got, you've got 30 feet on each side and he's stuck. And he says, ah, no problem. All I need is a ladder. So he goes home, he gets a ladder, comes back in, jumps in the pit and climbs out. Okay. Uh, <laughs> obviously begs the question as to how we got out of the pit to get the ladder to solve the problem. The, the, the proposal of, of prebiotic natural selection does essentially the same thing. One Nobel Prize winning biochemist who works on the problem of the origin of life has put it this way. He says, theories of prebiotic natural selection need information, which implies they have to presuppose what's, what is to be explained in the first place. Now, there are 
Other proposals, uh, more contemporary versions of these proposals, these were first made in the 60s, and um, the, in particular, the idea of RNA world tries to lower the, the threshold to, to get evolution going instead of a self-replicating organism. It proposes just a self-replicating molecule or system of molecules. In my book, uh, I have a whole chapter on this uh, proposal called the RNA world, and I give a very uh, detailed critique of its many problems. If you'd like to know more about that, you can, you can lo look to the book on that. Um, a third approach, the third broad explanatory approach to explaining the origin of information has been the idea of self-organization or relying on processes of necessity or law. And th this idea was actually the idea that had been proposed by Dean Kenyon, the scientist I mentioned who repudiated his own theory in the mid-'80s. His idea was kind of based on something that's intuitive from chemistry, that there are arrangements of molecules that are highly ordered that are the result of physical and chemical forces. For example, the crystal of salt. The Na has a plus charge, the Cl a minus charge. There's an attraction, a bond that forms, and in a solution of those uh, uh, of the Na's and the Cl's, you'll form nice, rigid, orderly crystals. And voila, you have no design. No, uh, no chance. It's essentially a very organized, law-like process that produces an organization of, of elements. And he proposed that that type of process might be responsible for the origin of the information in DNA. Uh, actually, the origin of the arrangement of amino acids and proteins. He hoped it might something like that might pan out for DNA as well. But as he began to reflect on the problem, he realized that it, on, this, on his propo own proposal, he realized it would, wouldn't work. The first First of all, he realized that the proteins are built from DNA. So even if this did work for proteins, and there's real problems with this proposal for proteins, he had to also make it work for DNA. But in the case of DNA, it was clear that it couldn't work. And you can see this if you look at the chemical structure of DNA on the, uh, on the PowerPoint screen here. Um, on the outside of the molecule here, you have the, the sugar phosphate backbone. On the interior of the molecule, you have the bases, the A's, C's, G's, and T's. The information is carried in this vertical axis. And uh, if you notice carefully, remember the idea of self-organization was that you get chemical bonds that would form that would cause the constituent parts of the molecule to arrange themselves in a particular way. Notice along the spine of the DNA molecule, there are no bonds between the A's, C's, G's, and T's in this vertical axis. There, in other words, there's no chemistry that is forcing the arrangement of those characters in the way that Kenyon had, had, had hoped or anticipated. In addition, there, where there is a bond between the base and this sugar phosphate backbone, it's the same type, type of bond in each case. For chemists, it's called an N-glycosidic bond. And it'll, what it, it does is it allows any one of the four bases to attach to this backbone at any site. So the chemistry does not force any particular arrangement of characters. Now, I have a little illustration, again, that makes this a little more accessible for non-chemists. Non I've got a, 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 a message here pandering to the local audience, although maybe not here at Heritage. I don't know if Heritage folks think DC actually rocks right now. But um, <laughs> the idea is, you've got, this is a metal chalkboard. You've got little magnetic letters. There's a force of attraction that causes the letters to stick to the, to the backboard, OK? The backboard is like the backbone in my analogy, in my chemical analogy. Um, and the idea here is that the force of magnetic attraction is not responsible. You can see clearly it's not responsible for the arrangement of characters that constituted this, this short message I had here. What is responsible? Actually, in this case, it's, it's, it's a mind. It's an intelligence. And, um, and this is the intuition that was circulating among some of the scientists who were first interested in intelligent design, that information is a product, a hallmark of mind. And my story is that when I set off to graduate school, I wanted to find out if that intuition could be made into a rigorous scientific hypothesis. It's intuitive, but could it be made scientific? And so one of the things I did, I, mean, we, I, I studied these different approaches, and I found that chance, necessity, self-organization, each one of them failed to, to explain the origin of information. But I wondered, was there any you know, force to the idea, logic to the idea, that intelligent design could provide a rigorous scientific explanation of this, this critical phenomenon, the, the origin of information? So I began to study the method of Darwin. 
and the way he studied the remote past, the way he pioneered this scientific method for studying events in the remote past. And it, it turns out he uses a method called inference to the best explanation. And he hints at it here where he says that he's, he's inferring his view of evolutionary theory until some better hypothesis comes along. The method is inherently comparative. What you're trying to do is infer a cause which will explain the event you're trying to, uh, or, uh, infer a cause that could explain the event, some event in the remote past. We're trying to explain the origin of life, the origin of the information that's necessary. So, I've, so the idea is you look at different possible causes, and I've been doing that so far, looking at causes based on chance, based on necessity, and the combination of the two. And the idea when you're using this method is you're trying to infer that explanation, which, if true, would best explain the event. But the question arose, what constitutes the best explanation? How do we know when, when, uh, when a cause constitutes the best explanation? Well, it turns out that both Darwin and his scientific mentor, Lyell, or one of his mentors, had a simple, commonsensical rule of reasoning that they used. And it was, it was, it was just this, that if you're trying to infer events in the remote past, you should infer a cause which is known to produce the event or effect you're trying to explain. Sounds simple enough. In eastern Washington, we've got a big fat layer of ash. Um, we would, uh, using their rule of method, infer the, not the earthquake hypothesis, but rather the volcanic eruption hypothesis, because we know that volcanoes are known to produce volcanic ash layers, whereas earthquakes are not. The way Lyell put it, he said, the, the, the good historical scientist is looking for causes now in operation or presently acting causes, causes that are known to produce the effect in question. And as I began to investigate how this method was used in science, I asked myself a question. What is the cause now in operation, the cause that we know from our uniform and repeated experience, another of Lyell's dictums, that produces information? What cause, based on our experience, do we know is capable of producing information? And I knew there was only one. In fact, I'd investigated the other failed attempts. And I knew from, but I knew from experience, from our ordinary experience, and also some scientific experience, that, it, that intelligence is capable of producing information, but no other cause is. And th this idea was reinforced by uh, 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 something I read in an early, uh, one of the molecular biologists who was a pioneer in applying information theory to molecular biology, is Henry Quassler in the 60s. He says, the creation of information is habitually associated with conscious activity. And of course, we know that's true. If you look at a newspaper headline, or a hieroglyphic inscription, or a section of software and a computer code, and you trace that information back to its source, you inevitably come to a mind, not a material process. That's what we know from our uniform and repeated experience, the basis of all scientific reasoning about the past. So when we find information in the DNA molecule encoded in this functionally specified way, the most logical thing to conclude using this scientific method that Darwin himself pioneered is that intelligence played a role in the origin of the information necessary to produce life. So I concluded that, in fact, it is possible to make a scientific case for intelligent design. That's what my book does. I use this method of multiple competing hypotheses or inferring to the best explanation. I have examined this question of the origin of the information necessary to build life, and then I look at the competing classes of explanations, those based on chance, necessity, the combination of the two, and infer that there is only one known cause for the origin of information, and therefore the best thing to infer, the best explanation of that information, is intelligent design. That's the argument I present in the signature in the cell. Um, I've presented it today based essentially on molecular biology 101. But in the book, I look at some other more recent discoveries about the informational properties of the cell, things that have come out of the genome projects, and especially the recent uh, discoveries under the heading of the ENCODE project. And, uh, and look at some other fascinating evidences of design in the way that the information in DNA is organized in a files within folders, folders within superfolders. Uh, there's a hierarchical filing system in DNA. There's an error correction, essentially a spell check system within the cell. There is also a way of, uh, of storing information that's very much like the, the, the door, uh, data storage systems in modern digital computers. Uh, it's a, uh, a storage and retrieval system that's distributed. It's a fascinating uh, system, the, the whole information processing system in the cell. So I think there are many other evidences of design other, other than just the, the, sim the simple linear array of code, 
but that's a good enough place to start. So that, that's the argument of the book, and I'd be grateful for any questions and comments uh, as we conclude here. Yes, in the back. Science in the past has had huge gaps, and they've closed those gaps. So uh, what's the big deal here? Just give science a little time. That is a very common objection to the, the case I've made. I uh, have a fairly extensive uh, refutation, a, uh, or attempted refutation, in um, one of the latter chapters of my book, Chapter 17. Um, let me, let me, have, let me re represent the, the objection symbolically. Uh, because I think it's, 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 clear, it's important to be clear about what's going on. Um, uh, the God of the gaps argument is the, essentially the claim that we're inferring design because of a gap in our scientific knowledge, because of what we don't know, our ignorance. Uh, it, logically, there's a fallacy called the argument from ignorance, and it would be, uh, we could illustrate it with a political example. We could say, well, um, some, maybe a conservative would say, uh, John Kerry has all these bad qualities, therefore he's he, he'll be a bad, you know, he would be a bad president, therefore George Bush would be a good president, okay? But that's an argument from ignorance. We would, to make a good argument for George Bush's presidency, you would have to give some positive reasons for believing that Bush is a, a good president. We're accused of making an argument very much like that, saying, well, natural processes can't produce the effect in question, in this case, the digital information necessary to get life going. Uh, therefore, ID or God or some intelligent agent did it. But that's not actually how we're arguing. We're arguing like this. We're saying natural processes cannot produce or have not produced the effect in question, digital information. But there is a kind of cause which is known to produce that effect. That kind of cause is intelligence. And therefore, intelligent design, mind, is, a, is the best explanation among the contenders that are on the table. And this is a classic scientific style of reasoning. It's not fallacious logically. It's provisional. If new evidence came along that suggested there was some, some cause that was as good or better, then we'd have to look at that. But the, the argument as, as formulated is not an argument from ignorance. Therefore, it's not a God of the gaps argument. And uh, that's my answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you suggest that using current examples like computer code that we've produced, our minds have produced, this is an example of producing digital information. Obviously, when this happened in the primordial ooze with DNA or protein, it wasn't our minds doing it. Do you speculate as to the nature of this intelligence, where that intelligence came from, how that intelligence evolved? I mean, I know Richard Dawkins makes the argument that because of what we know about evolution, a greater intelligence would have to come from a lesser one, or a greater kind of more complex life form, and have to come from a lesser complex life form. So where did this great, obviously very complex, obviously very intelligent mind come from so as to create you know, DNA? Yeah, e excellent, e excellent question. Uh, Dawkins formulates an objection by saying, well, then, then who designed the designer? And if you, if you have to answer that with another pos postulation of a designer, then you've got an infinite regress. Um, well, there's basically two possibilities. Uh, either the designing intelligence is imminent within the universe. Uh, Francis Crick was uh, uh, at least toyed with that idea with his panspermia hypothesis that life was seeded here on Earth from intelligent beings in space. Um, or there's the idea that the intelligence is transcendent, that it is from beyond the universe, uh, something more like God. Uh, so in, in brief, aliens are God. I myself favor the God hypothesis. Um, but I acknowledge that from the biology alone, you have to leave open both of those two, two possibilities. Uh, I favor the God hypothesis for a number of reasons, but scientifically speaking, I think there's also other evidence of design that has to be reckoned with, in particular the fine-tuning that exists from the very beginning of the universe. And I'm also very impressed with the current versions of the cosmological argument that are based on the observation that the universe begins at a singularity and that the universe is not eternal and, and self-existent, which I think all, actually also helps to answer Dawkins' objection. I think in any worldview or system of thought, um, you have to answer, every, every system of thought has the same problem. It has to answer the question, what is the prime reality? What is the thing from which everything else comes? And I think post-new cosmology, Big Bang theory, materialism 
is a very crummy candidate to uh, to 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 be you know matter and energy rather or a crummy candidate to be the thing from which everything else comes. So I, I think it's a, a more plausible system overall. Theism provides a more plausible uh, overall explanatory system for taking into account these big developments in science, the new evidence concerning the origin of the universe, the fine-tuning of the universe, as well as evidence of design and biology someplace down the timeline. Yeah. Other? Okay. Got one more in the back. We could, Becky, and All then, right, I'll, very then, good. I'll, then I'll yield. Yeah. What do Dawkins and Dennett say in response to your comments about the origin of life? Well, Dawkins is interestingly, I mean, he's not known for reticence in defending evolutionary theory, but uh, he acknowledged, at least at the, in the end of the, the Expelled movie, when he was being interviewed by Ben Stein, that, quote, no one knows, and I think he was talking from within an evolutionary uh, framework, how life first originated. So I don't, th uh, you know, my claim that, that intelligent design is the best explanation is not usually refuted by people saying, well, we have a better, a better answer at this point. Uh, there's general agreement that there is no adequate explanation for the origin of, of, of the first life. What people will typically try to say instead is, well, you can't consider intelligent design because it, it violates the rules of science. It's not scientific. But um, our response to that is to say that the primary obligation of the scientist is to follow the evidence wherever it leads to the best causal explanation, irrespective of whether that points to uh, intelligence or a materialistic answer. So, thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Meyer. Again, a provocative and interesting discussion. We have these books available for sale for anyone who would like to purchase it, read it, and engage him in more discussion. I'm sure that he would be delighted to uh, have an online discussion or debate with anyone here who has purchased the book and wants to pursue that. We are grateful that you took time out of your day to come today. Thank you, Dr. Meyer, and thank you all very much. I believe we have some lunch uh, to serve to you outside. <laughs>